Um, this is a session about distributed caching, so less time to check if you're in the right room. Uh, but uh, I can tell uh, there's more dedicated people right here. So uh, my name is Victor Gemov. I work as a senior solutions architect for a company called Hizzlecast. I also developer of the kit in this company. And um, I'm also a Twitter junkie, I like Twitter. So you can follow me on Twitter. I'm a very interesting person. So, and uh, without further ado, let's go straight to the plan. All right. Another thing that I also, um, on the conferences, I'm building very scalable Hello World applications. So, and kudos to um, Kenny, uh, inventing this title for everyone who on the stage and talking about things. Um, so yeah. Why cash, right? So, um, why you want to cash, and um, what to cash, what, how it's good or bad. You can see it, you can see it, come on in. All right. So, let's start with why, right? So, let's start with the problem statement. So, what kind of problems do we have? So, a typical enterprise application contains multiple layers. It contains uh, uh, different layers, starting from uh, UI, business logic, and data access layer, some of the middleware, and integration with other systems, uh, messaging systems, etc. So on these many layers, we're increasing, um, increasing latency of the application. So from, from one layer of abstraction to another, the application may uh, slow down, usually. So then certain things need to be taken care of um, while optimizing things, um, and how to deal with the slowness, etc. So this is like a typical, uh, typical business application that interacts with, um, with some of the certain services, databases, no SQL, various services. And at some point, you can tweak, you can, you can tune, uh, and you can uh, uh, do whatever you can. Uh, for example, optimize the fast access to your database. Um, you can uh, change your network so the access to the database will be faster. Or if you're dealing with some external service, um, you can switch to a different provider of the data. However, you've tried everything. And um, you tried everything, and it looks like you cannot do anything more. So what do you need to do? Another problem in this kind of architecture might came from the perspective that sometimes application is not just a one instance application. Even though we're talking about microservices, it doesn't mean the microservice needs to, uh, doesn't need to be scaled. So, so in the case of we have another instance of this data, maybe that stores inside inside the application that might need to be available on multiple uh, on the multiple layers or multiple instances of the same application. So how are we going to deal with this? So my proposal, yeah, let's cache everything. And in this case, cache uh, will be here in between that allows the application um, to, first of all, uh, scale out if it's distributed cache. We're going to talk about distributed caching today. And uh, to provide this uh, pattern called read-write uh, and read through cache and write through cache, meaning that you go into the cache and cache will check if data is there, it's not there, it will fetch it for you. If it's, uh, if it's there, it will just simply return. All right, so then basically cache is everywhere. Um, and as we know, you can, we can call any um, storage that has like a key value access pattern that can be in cache. It needs to be simple, simple accessing, simple access pattern. So the cache is the, uh, it's basically a copy of the data. And the, the beauty of this, the access to this copy of the data happens very quickly, uh, or supposed to happen very quickly. Even we um, have some data in the database, we can cache it locally in some, some sort of hash map or some sort of map, and uh, retrieve it from, from local memory. It will be much faster. So um, even we're dealing with uh, accessing a database where, for example, relational database we have situation where our data is in relational form, third normal form, multiple tables. Usually when we're accessing from the cache or some of the um, key value storage, it's normalized, denormalized version. So um, in other, in other, from in other terms, from terms of uh, uh, market services and uh, um, event sourcing, it's just another representation or it's another read model in terms of SQRS. Uh, so, obviously, um, if we're talking about CPRS, we can also say cache can be event source. And uh, I'm sorry, I just couldn't resist to put this because it's, I, I, I'm run out of the good options, so I've come up with some bad option. But there are some things to, to consider. 
So um, basically, why people using caches? Um, to improve application performance, um, like I already said, multiple layers of like, application accessing to data, um, accessing to multiple things um, from multiple layers of application that will increase um, total, total latency of multiple components. Um, some of the expensive operations can be avoided. For example, you're dealing with some of the computation over and over again for same key or for same customer. So why don't you cast this data? Because it's not going to change for 24 hours or for like a work work hours or something like that. So some of the data can be uh, can be cached easily. So um, another option. So. Uh, even though the application itself might run on some of the hardware uh, that um, has very powerful capabilities, usually application do not try to use all these capabilities and some of the solutions, uh, caching solutions, especially in process caches, um, allow you to do um, kind of like a scale up. You can basically increase capacity of the application by bringing more hardware like this. So you have uh, the, the small guy, Professor Banner. Who grows into this uh, this hall guide, but essentially it's the same application, same 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 um, same application, just increasing capacity of this of this hardware. Some of the distributed uh, caches examples allow you to um, scale scale out the uh, if you like uh, different components of your system that uh, different pieces or different um, instances uh, might interact, and they will create shared memory. So basically, this thing allows to form a cluster with commodity, uh, commodity machines that will form some, some sort of shared memory where the different components can interact through this. And uh, as I already mentioned multiple times, key value pattern, very simple, simple, uh, simple to implement, simple to access, simple to use. All right. However, if we're returning to this uh, scale up, um, scale up point. So you can actually scale one machine to one until like one particular point when you um, can uh, grow the hardware. However, it's not always the case. So sometimes um, you need to bring, um, you, you, don't have, you have so much data that it's not uh, practically uh, to store it in one place. Or data may be very important that um, you store it in one computer or store it in one node but you actually have, you need to have like full tolerance, resiliency, etc. So in this case, it may be not, uh, not a good choice to store it in one place. So let's talk a little bit about the data distribution. So how the typical uh, data distribution happens in a distributed cache. And uh, so how many of you can uh, tell me what you see on this picture in terms of, uh, in terms of data distribution? So uh, in this picture, I have uh, two panels of data distribution. How many patterns of data distribution you, you might know? Okay, I will explain. In this picture, I have uh, two data sets, absolutely identical data sets. And on the second part, I have data set that they present in a different form. It's like a sliced data set. Anyone? Any ideas? Okay, so it is a rotation, right? So we have the same data that copied the multiple nodes. Uh, so, and what's the, not the opposite, but another uh, very useful pattern that people use for data distribution? Partitioning or sharding, correct. But this picture may be not very good uh, from a perspective of explaining how the data will, you know, return to the same form. But in general, yeah, so we have uh, two data sets. Let me put this the another way. This is things that most developers would understand, you know, squares um, and arrows. It's much, much easier to understand. So basically, we have a replicated data set which contains copies of the data on the both nodes, and we have a partitioned or sharded data set where whole data set that the, uh, the, the, the developer uh, working with, this data set will be sharded across multiple nodes, right? But in practice, in practice um, usually these two patterns are not used in a, in a pure sense. They complement each other. They usually use um, the pattern called consistent hashing that allows to, uh, based on the key, uh, find a way where this um, value will be stored and also for providing some of the uh, fault tolerance capabilities 
then they will look at it another node. So, um, but in general, this is what the patterns. So let's talk about like we're talking about some of the practical things, some of the theoretical things. Now, so talk some practical things. So first of all, Hazelcast is the um, the thing that um, provides you capabilities for building distributed caches, right? So it's in memory, um, meaning that data stored in operational uh, memory of the system is not stored on the disk. Um, it's stored in memory, access pattern very quick. And um, it's a patch and it's a license. Uh, it provides many uh, different APIs. And today we're going to focus on some of the caching capabilities. But I also touch base on some other features like um, messaging or maybe computing, but if you like. So, and how it's related to, to Cloud Foundry. So, um, so in memory data grid or the in memory, any type of in-memory system is very, from my perspective, is very good candidate for any source of um, uh, containerization or any source of um, um, abilities to run on the cloud. Because uh, basically it's in-memory, it's ephemeral, it doesn't require any storage, it requires fast network, it requires clustered storage, so you can have a data on one node that can be also store some of the backups on another node. So the clustered environment is very good fit for um, for a memory system like Hazelcast. And um, today I'm going to be using um, Hazelcast that's deployed in the Pivotal Cloud Foundry um, that uh, uses uh, Hazelcast dial that was developed for uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry. So uh, the uh, tile itself allows to start uh, individual node that Hazelcast cluster on um, on individual VM. So um, in this demo, I'm running this. Uh, Total Cloud Foundry in uh, Amazon Web Services. I use Amazon to provision my um, my cluster. So uh, multiple availability zones supported out of the box in the tile. Um, the Bosch used uh, used to um, to support a, a high availability of this particular node. Plus, um, uh, it interacts with uh, on-demand uh, broker, so it doesn't require any pre-provisioning of the nodes to deploy this, so everything will be uh, taken care of by, by Tile itself. So, um, by itself, Hazelcast is written in Java, um, but uh, we have many bindings for different languages, and today we're going to talk about Node.js particular thing. So, uh, I guess we already have about slides, so let's talk about some of the demo, right? Um, so, what's the, what's the premise of this demo? Um, how many of you guys here are Node.js developers? Okay, okay, some of you are interesting because I expected more, more hands um, in there. Okay, so um, in, this, in this example, I'm going to be using Express. Uh, for those of you who don't know Node.js, Express is very powerful and uh, a very famous or very popular framework for Node.js running web applications. And I'm writing the web application that will um, microservice, you can say the microservice, that will interact with um, some external system. This is an external system, um, in this particular case, it's going to be a GitHub. So in my microservice, I want to use some of the information that GitHub provides about organizations. So I will create GitHub API, and I will um, store this, uh, this result internally. So the way how it works, I will just issue a um, HTTP request for this URL based on a particular organization that I will retrieve from my application parameter. And after that, I will uh, store it in the cache. Also, Express allows me to, in Express, they call it like middleware. So I have this special type of uh, middleware that called cache. So before, um, it will retrieve a result and return it to user for me. Uh, we actually will check it with the cache. If it's if it's cached, um, if it's cached, so it will just return. If it's not cached, it will retrieve it from same uh, same 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 um, um, GitHub API. So let's let's show let me show you how it looks like. So as you can see from the top right now, I'm running this in. Uh, Okay. 
So I'm running this in um, in, uh, in uh, Amazon as a as a, as a uh, uh, cloud foundry, and the one you see right now on the screen is uh, this management center console that allows me to see the status of the cluster. So what I see right now that I provisioned a cluster of uh, three nodes, and uh, right now I don't have any data here. Right. So another thing that I have is my application that deployed uh, deployed on this. On this API, you can actually go there and, and uh, play around a bit, but not too much. Have a, let's see if this actually works. Uh, uh, yeah, so there's some some things that uh, you can see on the main screen. So uh, basically, it runs a uh, typical Node.js uh, the build pack. Um, it interacts with um, different components of the system interact via uh, the cap uh, services environment variable. So when I start, uh, when I start my uh, my cluster, it actually publishes some of the information about the cluster. So in this particular case, it uh, publishes information about members, like uh, IP addresses. So my client, in this case, my Node.js app, um, will uh, will will create this from the cap services and uh, parse it and provide this configuration parameter for my uh, for my application. Now, so let's let's see what this application actually can do. So there is a there are uh, two to uh, three endpoints. One endpoint will allow us to get some basic stats. So for example, if I go to here and do something like this, um, it will actually will create GitHub information about this particular. Um, about this particular uh, repository, also I can do something like this. Uh, I can do Hazelcast, Hazelcast also on GitHub. Um, let's retrieve the repository, and I see response time is half a. If you if you can see here, it's around uh, roughly like half a second, right? So when the next time we'll hit this, this result will be retrieved from. From the cache, so my application will interact with the cache server and get this information uh, back. So if I will switch back to this, and I will show you management center console. Now in management center, what I will see there is uh, my org map that will store the information about Hazelcast and CloudFact organizations on GitHub. So if I'll go here, I'll see Hazelcast, um, and I will see I will retrieve. Oops. And I will retrieve something from here. Um, no enemies. Oh, oh yep, live demos. Live demos, always tables. So 61 repositories, uh, the store is a key, it's an organization name, value is number of repositories. Now, interesting thing here is that also I'm storing information about the repositories itself, and I cache them in the data structure called multi-map. So multi-map data structure allows you to store multiple values. Uh, by the same key. So in this case, uh, key in the organization, number of repositories, it will be number of values. And I also can expose this information to, to the REST service. Um, so I will do, where's my, oops. Uh, I will go here and I will see the information that already cached. So uh, the retrieval time is extremely fast because it, it retrieves it from, uh, from, from the cache. And more important that um, if I will do something like this once again, this time, let me actually show you um, CF logs. Uh, hopefully, I will be able to yep, connect it. So the hash key time is ridiculously, ridiculously small. So the reason for that is that, uh, where is it? So let me show you some of the interesting pieces. So now my application interacts with the cache, it's all good, but if data was already, uh, um, my application already used this application, so uh, we've already used this data, so in this case, I also can uh, leverage thing called near cache. 
So I can basically, on the side of my Node.js application, I also uh, store this result, so I don't need to go to the cache server and retrieve it once again. So up to this point, my information about organizations will be, will be stored in the near cache of my application. So once again, this, um, I start my application, it establishes connection to my cluster, it starts listening to the port um, that, uh, by the way, um, needs to be uh, retrieved this way because the environment variable, this process and port will be passed by uh, Cloud Foundry here. Uh, and if it will not be there, just using this one, this is this suitable for, for local development. Now, some of the interesting things um, that, that you can see here also. Um, from perspective of API, the capabilities that uh, can be done, Interesting thing here is, uh, where is it? The thing called the map list. So basically, each and every time when I will interact with my data, I register a handler, a some particular callback uh, the function that will be invoked when something happens to my data. So in this case, I can also build more like reactive application when some, some component of the system to put data into cache, I can react with this. In this particular case, I just simply uh, write this information into, uh, into the console, but in this case, I can do something useful. And if I just need to have notification that something's changed, I can include value. So in this case, my, when I assign my um, entry listener, I'm saying here true. So in this case, value will be actually propagated inside here. And if I uh, don't need this, well, I just need to use it for notification-wise. So in this case, I just uh, can put in this false. Now, um, again, let me show you differences if I would be running this uh, without cache. So there is a um, the special type of uh, URL where I can bypass cache. So in this case, um, you will see the difference. So if I'll go here, um, so once again, so creating Hazelcast. 99 milliseconds. If I do bypass, um, it has a, like half a second. So the difference you yeah, probably you, you probably can see. And if it's it's numbers are going to be uh, even bigger for um, for Cloud Foundry because um, Cloud Foundry uh, Cloud uh, Cloud Foundry repository uh, is enormous, uh, or organization in GitHub is enormous. Um, it's 100, but I think it's just the li limit of the GitHub uh, that uh, limits the number um, repositories per page. Um, so if I do bypass, so it takes even, even longer so to retrieve this information. So the caching uh, can be applied uh, very quickly. Um, so this is a also open source component. It's interesting thing that actually this component is written in TypeScript and uh, it uh, can be used in the in JavaScript projects. Um, I will post a URL where we can find some of the interesting information. So, so from perspective of the features, I don't want to talk a lot about like what kind of features are available and what can be done, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is a website for it. There is a, a plenty of um, uh, the charts and the different features that are available, map, cache, um, integration with the listeners, entry processors. Entry processors are cool. So in this case, if you need to change some value, uh, you don't need to retrieve it, change it locally and put it back. So in this case, you can actually send a small, small task like a stored procedure in, in, your, uh, in your database that will change the value in place. Or you can do some, some um, some more like custom logic. For example, you need to increase uh, salary for all or your employees. So in this case, you don't need to go through the or iterate through the old elements of this distributed map. You can send a uh, small piece of computation that will be it's basically just a um, small small function that will be executed on the server side that will do it once, and you don't need to move data around. Um, also, I, I wrote this uh, the ref card. I don't know if you. If you've seen those before, it's like some, some, of, some of the things that you can actually print and have it on your desktop, or you can just simply you know, print and put it in the restroom in your work. When they, your, uh, your colleagues will be you know, in the restroom, they will learn something.
rather than just checking the social network feeds. Um, and uh, the NPM package is, is, based, is there. Um, so if you're looking for some, some interesting caching solution to play around, I would suggest to use this. So a couple things about, uh, about this demo. So what, what I did this uh, this uh, CF Summit uh, 2017 Wednesday um, is, is, is on GitHub. So it um, includes Java component that you will deploy uh, uh, that uses all configuration. Oh, I didn't show this cool part. So while I'm talking and taking some questions, I can actually um, show you how I can let me scale this. So now um, I almost forgot the most fun part. So now I have three nodes. I can go ahead and say CF update service. Uh, and after that will increase my cluster by four nodes. Um, and uh, hopefully it will um, <laughs> it, it, it will be executed. Now and the second link, uh, slides and the video will be posted back here. So you can go here. This is by the way the right slide to take pictures. Um, if you have any questions, like I said, I'm always on Twitter and uh, ready to talk to anyone. Um, how many of you guys have a Twitter here? Okay, good, because sometimes people don't have a Twitter, this is why I have an email here. So for those people who don't have a Twitter, I have an email, and this is my, my website. So now I can take some questions and uh, talk about some of the use cases. Thank you for, uh, thank you for, uh, for, for this 30 minutes. Uh, I think we don't need in this room, but what the heck. Uh, so how's the synchronization done between the uh, nodes of the Hazard cast? I mean, okay. if, if it's, there is distance between, between uh, the nodes. Yeah. So synchronization happened in the following way. So basically, the Hazard cast uh, interact between nodes uh, through TCP. So uh, it, is, it is Soviet connection and nodes constantly chatting. So um, when I talk about the data distribution pattern, Hazelcast uses a similar concept called uh, assistant caching. So basically, data stored in one place, and there would be some replicas of the data. I can actually, it's better to actually show it in, in the management center. Um, in the management center, oh, it already started doing something. So in this case, I have a two, uh, two entries in this map, and one entry stored in one node, and another entry stored in another node. So using this uh, hashing algorithm, uh, it'll cast will place them in one node or another node, and also it will create a backup. So the, basically the things when you're shutting down some nodes and restarting some other nodes, as you can see, even though I already uh, lost one node, now a node comes back, I, I, I'm not losing the data because, first of all, my data is partitioned, so data is distributed across uh, all nodes of the cluster. Plus, it has a, we call it backup count, but some people in their products are called replica count. The partition that holds particular data as a, as a backup. Um, we actually have very extensive documentation explaining how this process is done. Um, and it's you know, far beyond on, you know, five minutes of, uh, of uh, explaining. So, but the, uh, the most important part of the thing here is that you don't know, now you see it, I'm writing four nodes, it's scaled up. And uh, actually, it happens without wattage. So Hazelcast is designed to be a um, system that works in an environment where you're expecting some failures. So what we like to see in distributed systems, we cannot prevent failures. We just need to embrace them and uh, deal with the situation that we're living in. We, we, we're operating in a very um, uh, hostile environment, I would say. So that's why killing node or killing two nodes will not basically affect uh, to data. About the distance, so usually because it's TCP and uh, the, because it's a uh, um, data consistency is is, is important part, um, we recommend to deploy Hazelcast nodes close to each other, preferably a local type of network. However, if you need to have a um, distributed system across multiple um, availability zones, it's possible. Uh, we're not recommend to deploy Hazelcast across multiple regions 
because in this case latency will affect performance of the cluster and consistency of the data. Uh, for that purpose, we have uh, the, the WAN application port. Um, yeah, basically, it's called WAN application. It allows you to synchronize cluster across multiple uh, regions. Okay, any questions? I have one here. Uh, I have a quick question on the architecture of the yeah. cast grid. So, in terms of gap theorem, do you, are you like CA or CP? Okay, so the question was. Uh, how I can how I can tell about Hazel Cast from perspective of gap theorem. Yeah. So it's actually a good question because it depends. It depends how you would what kind of guarantees you want to have. The so Hazel Cast is very explicit and very configurable tool. For some cases, for some data structure, you can say, okay, I want to have strong consistency. In this case, you can assign things like you can use synchronous APIs that will provide you, you know, synchronous response. Um, or for some cases, you won't have availability. So in this case, you will decide about consistency after. So if your cluster will fall apart using split brain, uh, you can decide after if this data was modified in multiple places. Um, if you want to have a consistency, you can assign quorum saying that if cluster size will go down for less than like three nodes, so in this case, I will not accept any modifications, but I will be able to serve uh, reads. Um, in this case, my data will be consistent in a situation where cluster formation is not full and will maybe I will not be able to you know, hold all this data. So all these things are very relative to gap theory because it's, it's a more like a theory. In, in practice, we allow you to control. As a developer, we can decide. And it's actually per data structure. You can say one cache, I don't care about consistency, I just care about availability. In another cache or another map, you can configure, say, no, for this one, I want to have a quorum. And in this case, I cannot go smaller than three nodes in my cluster. No, four nodes. Okay, last question. Uh, so I got a question on the, the feature you have on. So does the PCF or the Hazel Cast style on PCF support WAN? Uh, so we right now it, it does support, but we don't have a running demo right now. But uh, my colleague, so the thing is right now with WAN is that you need to know explicit addresses to establish WAN connection. So what we're doing right now, and it's going to be released in a couple of weeks, it's the uh, discovery in WAN. So you can use uh, any discovery service, or you will be able to use also like a VCAP to pass this information to different data uh, to different data sets or to different regions. So they will be able to uh, discover each other. So yes, uh, the tile itself supports, um, uh, but uh, we 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 don't have like a demo that I can demonstrate this to you today. You can you can uh, give me your your contact if I if I if you need this demo, I will I will be able to to show it. Okay, we need to wrap up for the next speaker, but I'm sure we'd like to talk to Victor. Yeah, I will be heading out around, so we'll uh, let's let's talk about. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thanks for your time.